All right, so it's a pleasure to start the second session of the second day with Omri Lassel from Weizmann talking about phase induced Majorana devices. All right, uh, hi, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Gil. And also uh, many thanks for the organizers for inviting me to speak in this uh, wonderful conference. It's really, uh, I'm really happy to, to share with you our uh, recent uh, adventures on trying to engineer Majorana devices that don't require any magnetic fields. They don't, they only rely on, um, on phase biasing. And it's really, actually, I'm very happy to be talking after this um, discussion session and after Elsa's talk, because they, they really give much context to what I want to, uh, to talk to you about. So uh, basically, and especially after uh, the following, uh, the, these last two weeks, two days, uh, we all know how to make my runs in, in theory, right? Uh, but let's talk about the numbers. Let's just talk about what do we actually need uh, to make them. And uh, in practice, many of the prominent proposals require uh, pretty substantial magnetic fields. Um, let me just flash some, some examples. This is the first experiment um, on, on uh, nanowires proximitized to, to uh, superconductors. And here the required field is of the order of 200 or 300 millitesla. This is a, uh, the, the planar Josephson junction device. And here again, the fields are of the order of um, half a Tesla, something like that. And here in one of the most uh, recent proposals of the nanowires, we, uh, of the full shell nanowires, we've just heard uh, quite a lot about, uh, you still need something like 100 millitesla. So on the face of it, that doesn't seem so bad, right? So what's the problem with the magnetic field? Uh, so I've got, there are many things that you can do to deteriorate your uh, superconductor. But let me just show you a quick example from um, a pretty recent experiment where um, from Charlie Marcus's group, they uh, built the qubit out of this uh, indium arsenide wire while threading a magnetic field through the, uh, along the wire. And they measure the qubit lifetime as a function of the magnetic field. And as you can see already at something like uh, tens of milliteslas, like 40 millitesla, the qubit lifetime becomes uh, greatly deteriorated. And why is that happening? So basically when you start applying uh, magnetic fields to superconductors, you get dephasing, you get subgap states, you get magnetic impurities. So all of these really uh, deteriorate your superconductor and, uh, and that's, this really connects well to, to Adi's question of why is it so complicated to make Majoranas, right? So this whole story also carries to Majoranas. Um, and if you ask anyone, what's the most difficult aspect of making Majoranas, they'll say the thing that's closest to their hearts. And for me, it's the magnetic field. Magnetic field seems to really play a crucial role in, in obscuring all of our Majorana platforms. And now, uh, so what we set out to do is replace the Zeeman or orbital field with superconducting phase control. Uh, and there are some references down below for people who have also thought of, uh, of similar ideas. So the first thing we need to do to get, to get started is ask why do we even need the magnetic field? And of course, the immediate answer, we have to break time reversal symmetry, right? We don't wanna have these Kramer spheres. And when a physicist is asked to break time reversal symmetry, he immediately applies a magnetic field or uh, pushes a current. Uh, but, but since we're talking about superconducting systems, we have an additional degree of freedom, an additional knob, if you want, which is the phase. So if we have at least uh, two superconductors, then the phase between them can play the role of a time reversal breaker. Now, in what I'm going to show you here, You'll see that two is not enough. You'll have to have at least three superconductors because their phases, which I'm labeling here phi one, phi two, phi three, uh, and drawing them as angles on the unit circle, these phases will have to wind. So they will have to uh, encircle the origin. And this in conjunction with the aonov kashel phase, this, this is the phase that comes from uh, spin orbit coupling in closed trajectories, will actually be able to give rise to Majoranas at zero uh, applied magnetic field to the sample. So everything I'm going to show you uh, for the rest of this talk 
is really going to come from the interference between these two different phases, the superconducting phase acquired by pairs and the Aron of Kasher phase acquired by electrons. So the advantages, I kind of already mentioned them, is that we don't get all of these um, negative effects of the magnetic field, uh, which also, by the way, appear in full shell wires and also in these European sulfide wires, uh, where you don't have to apply an external magnetic field, but you do get an internal Zeeman coupling. So all of these issues, uh, they are still there. Uh, and and the, the way we avoid them is, is because we actually control the superconducting phases using extremely small fields. So how do you control the phases? You just connect two superconductors with a large uh, superconducting loop and thread uh, flux through it. Now, if you want to get a phase difference of the order of pi and your loop uh, size is of the order of micron, then you would have to apply something like a micro Tesla. So really zero for any reasonable mesoscopic superconductor. Now, before I start with our proposal, I want to say that people have already thought about harnessing this extra degree of freedom, this phase degree of freedom. So let me quickly uh, review two examples. So the first one uh, is, is taking just this nanowire model and simply driving a current through a supercurrent through the wire. So this supercurrent induces linear growth of the superconducting phase along the wire. And then uh, the authors calculated the phase diagram and they found the following. So in the absence of current, the topological transition happens when the Zeeman energy B is equal to delta. But as you, push, as you start pushing the current, you see that the critical field becomes uh, smaller and smaller. So you can actually get a uh, topological superconductivity at a much smaller uh, Zeeman field. But you do have to notice that it doesn't go all the way to zero. So the system becomes gapless. Another very prominent uh, platform that relies on these um, uh, phase biasing is the planar Josephson junction. So it was originally introduced in this two theory papers that came uh, in conjunction more or less. And the idea there is to take a, a um, uh, semiconductor, a 2D electron gas, as your uh, uh, host system with strong spin orbit coupling. Then you put two superconducting electrodes, you phase bias them, and you apply an in-plane uh, magnetic field. And this is what the phase diagram looks like. And as you can see, uh, when the phase bias is close to pi, then the, the necessary Zeeman field to bring you the, to the topological phase becomes smaller and smaller up to the point where at pi, the field is zero or very close to zero. So you might think that it's good to be around here, but actually when you look at the gap, you see that as always, there are no free meals. So if you wanna to go to pi, you basically really uh, reduce your uh, superconducting gap. So it's better to be away from these uh, boundaries all the way here in the middle. And pretty soon after these uh, proposals, there came two papers, two experimental papers, one from Charlie Marcus's group and the other from Amelia Kobe's group. And they, so they use different uh, material platforms, but they both uh, try to realize this, uh, this uh, platform. And they both reported pretty encouraging uh, first signatures of, of Majorana zero modes, uh, possible Majorana zero modes, uh, again, in the form of zero bias peaks. But again, we're after something different. We actually want to get rid of the magnetic field altogether. So let me show you uh, the basic, the most simple building block that allows us to do it. So we have in this model, this is the model of a ring. So we have three sites, one, two, and three. Uh, and each one of them is contacted by a superconductor of different space. So we have phi one, phi two, and phi three. Uh, now, why do we need three? So, you know, there's this uh, famous quote that one is a company, two is a crowd, and three is a party. And this really actually uh, translates pretty well to our, to our uh, system because one superconductor, the phase is unimportant. Two superconductors, if we draw them here, we just get a line. But three superconductors, these form a triangle and they can actually wind. So they have a, a sense in which you can have uh, phase winding. And indeed, uh, what we found is that if the superconducting phases wind, so they form what we call a discrete vortex, 
then it's possible to tune your model's parameters, which are chemical potential, pair potential, spin orbit, to get a pair of Majorana zero modes, and, and they're going to be delocalized around the ring. So that's actually a very important point. So these, um, these Majorana zero modes are going to have weights on all three sides, not necessarily equal weights, but they are most definitely not uh, spatially separated. So that means that we're not done. There's still, there's still some work to do. And uh, there are two ways that we could think of uh, to continue, to make this into like an actual device. So the first one is to take many copies of this, uh, of this uh, rings, and we're gonna couple them in the third dimension. So we're gonna couple them outside of the plane. So uh, we're putting them together into the form of a cylinder. And then what we're going to find is that the zero energy states that we found in the ring are now going to become uh, phase transition points in the cylinder at k equals zero. And the other way to continue is a chain. So now we have these um, uh, copies of the rings and we're coupling them inside the plane. And the way we thought of, of this model is uh, by an analogy to the Kitaev chain. And we can actually uh, uh, engineer the coupling between the rings to mimic uh, the perfectly localized point of the Kitaev chain. So these are the two directions that uh, we explored. And I'm going to now introduce them uh, one by one, starting with the non-planar models. So this is a, a work in collaboration with Carsten Flensberg, uh, Felix von Oppen, and Yuval Owen. And uh, again, the idea here is to take each, to go back to the ring and then just take each of the sites that we had and promote it to become a wire. So now we have three wires um, and, and they are, uh, each one of them is contacted by a different superconductor and um, the Hamiltonian that we had before for the ring, which is basically repeated here, uh, is, is simply the K parallel equals zero component of the Hamiltonian. So K parallel is along the wires, along the cylinder, and of course, there are other parts of the Hamiltonian. There is also a kinetic term uh, like k parallel square, and there can also be spin orbit coupling, which is linear in k parallel. But we are now looking for topological phase transitions, so we are only considering k parallel equals zero. Um, so since we're looking for the zero energy states of this uh, Hamiltonian, the easiest way is just to take a determinant and equate it to zero. And that's the expression that we get, so it's pretty long, but what I want you to notice about this expression is that uh, the phases, the superconducting phases only appear through this parameter F, which is manifestly gauge invariant, right? So it's the sum of cosines of phase differences. So only phase differences uh, actually appear here. And the spin orbit coupling actually only appears through this parameter capital lambda. So in the previous Hamiltonian, I generalized it to have uh, possibly non-equal spin orbit couplings between each two neighboring wires. But as you can see here, only the global property, the total spin orbit phase acquired in a closed loop is really what uh, determines the topological phase boundaries. So now it's, an, it's a nice exercise in, uh, in basic algebra to show that this equation has no solution unless F is smaller or equal to minus one. And this actually happens to be exactly the condition for phase winding. So let me, let me try to visualize this uh, geometrically. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in this diagram, so bear with me for a second there. Um, I'm setting phi three to zero, right? I can do that. I can just choose one of the phases to zero. And then I have the other two phases, phi one and phi two. And uh, only if and only if f is smaller than minus one, then the triangle that connects these uh, three three points on the unit circle connects, uh, sorry, encircles the origin. And then it's possible to have uh, a topological phase. So it's actually convenient to work in the, in the, uh, in these coordinates, theta and phi, which are sum and difference variables of phi one and phi two. And now let's just go ahead and plot the contour f equals minus one. So these are the triangles shown by the, uh, the, the black lines. And now, now we ask, so f smaller than minus one or being inside this triangle is definitely a necessary condition for topology. 
but is it also a sufficient condition? And the answer is that you can tune the parameters um, to such that this also becomes a sufficient condition. And then the topological phase occupies the entirety of these triangles. But if you go away from, um, from these uh, optimal parameters, then what you get is that the critical value of F becomes smaller. So it's a more stringent condition. And then the, uh, the topological phase occupies a smaller region of the triangles as shown by the dashed lines here. So uh, F equals minus one is when this triangle exactly uh, uh, crosses the, the uh, origin and smaller values of F mean that the, uh, the origin is nicely and comfortably contained in the triangle. So it's farther away from the transition. So now it's actually very uh, tempting to compare this phase diagram to the one of the uh, planar Josephson junction. So sorry for this uh, uh, overlap. So now the axes here are phase difference and also phase difference for us, so that's good. But here, the second axis is the Zeeman field, and for us, it's the other phase difference. So now look at this time reversal invariant point, phi equals phi, which is equivalent to this point for us. As you can see, around this point, the uh, extra phase difference theta plays a role very similar to the Zeeman field uh, EZ in driving the system into a topological phase. And this really um, highlights the fact that it's possible to replace Zeeman fields with, um, with, uh, with phase winding. And again, sorry for this uh, overlap. So another thing that's uh, interesting to compare to is the proposal by uh, Fu and Kane from 2008. So there the idea was to take the surface of a topological um, insulator and proximitize it with uh, three superconductors, again, with phases zero, phi one, and phi two. And their topological phase diagram is basically the same as we have. So it's just, it's, it's this just rotated. Uh, so what are the differences? First of all, um, we don't need a topological insulator. We're just using conventional materials, conventional uh, uh, semiconductors. So, so uh, the, the extra phase actually comes from spin orbit coupling and not from the topology of the insulator itself. And uh, the Fu and Kane proposal is two-dimensional, and where, whereas ours is, is quasi uh, one-dimensional. And that's, there's a very profound difference there, because in the Fu and Kane proposal, the topological, uh, the, the system is a topological superconductor by nature, even without phase biasing it. But when you phase bias, then Majorana zero modes appear. Whereas for us, what drives the system into a topological phase is the superconducting, <clears throat> sorry, phase winding. So Majoranas are in one-to-one -one correspondence with, <clears throat> sorry, with topological uh, superconductivity. So now let's, uh, let's shift gears. Now we want to look at the full phase diagram, including the gap. So now we have to actually look at all values of k parallel, not just k parallel equals zero. And this is uh, an example of a phase diagram that we get. So um, as you can see, topological phase occupies the triangle and one would, uh, or I would at least naively think that uh, it would be best to be here at the origin, uh, sorry, at the center of the triangles, right? Because that would be uh, the deepest you can be in the topological phase. That actually turns out to be wrong because the model is, is uh, ever so symmetric. When you're at this point, you have uh, what, you, what we call a perfect vortex, because then the phase differences between each two neighboring uh, wires is identical. So the system uh, retains a C3 rotation symmetry, and that manifests itself in a closing of the, of the gap at some finite K parallel. So it's not a topological closing, doesn't change your topological invariant whatsoever, but it's, uh, it uh, lowers your gap. So it's actually better to be not at the boundary, not at the center, but somewhere in between. Um, I didn't say that, but what I'm plotting here is the topological invariant, which is minus one or blue for topological and plus one or orange for trivial multiplied by the gap. 
And as you can see, we get a topological phase with about a third of the parent gap as the topological gap. And now if there's any justice in the world, then this uh, momentum space calculation should be translated into uh, my runaway functions for a finite system. So that's what we did here. We diagonalized finite Hamiltonian, and we see these two nicely separated my runaway functions, including the my oscillations and everything that one would expect. All right, so next, I wanna make this a little bit more accessible experimentally, but before I can do that, let's talk a bit about how to choose the parameters of the model. So if you go ahead and solve this uh, algebra that we had before, then uh, that gives you the optimal region. Uh, so the topological phase occupies the entire triangle or that the critical F is minus one. Then you get that the parameters mu, delta and lambda have to sit on this um, circle in their three-dimensional parameter space. So let's make some quick approximations to get some physical insight. Uh, if, we're, if we're assuming that delta is small, then this tells us something about mu and lambda. And if we now use some continuum expressions for the spin orbit energy and the spin orbit length, then we get the following condition for optimality. Uh, L times delta equals the spin orbit length multiplied by the spin orbit energy, which in turn is equal to the Rashba parameter alpha, which is actually what's, what's usually measured in, uh, in experiments. So here L is a typical length in the system, a typical distance between uh, neighboring superconductors. So with this intuition in mind, let's go to a more realistic version of the model where the idea is gonna be uh, to take the cylinder and then not so smoothly uh, deform it into something like this, which uh, does maintain the same, uh, the same topology though. So this is what the actual system we have in mind is. It's made of two, uh, two layers of 2D electron gas. Uh, we assumed here that the spin orbit coupling alpha points in opposite directions in the two bands, but that's really not important. The important thing is that it's not the same. Uh, now, why is that important? Because I want to be able to think about closed trajectories that contain, that actually encircle a finite amount of aronov kashev phase. So I can think of a trajectory starting here, then going into plane, crossing all three superconductors, then going down out of the plane, then all the way back and up again. And the phase that I acquire here and here do not cancel out. So that's very important. Uh, so of course, on top of all that, we have these three superconducting strips and they're phase biased. Um, just for, uh, for illustration, we show here how you can phase bias them by connecting loops, these dashed lines and threading flux. Uh, and the Hamiltonian is written down below. It's pretty simple. Uh, and what we do now is we simply take it, we discretize it, and we do the same exercise of calculating the topological phase diagram. So this is the phase diagram that we get when the material platform we chose to simulate is uh, aluminum as the superconductor and indium arsenide as the, uh, as the host to the electron gas. Now, it's important to notice that uh, for this specific choice of material platform, uh, the spin orbit energy is significantly smaller than uh, the pair potential. So really I'm comparing the gap here, not to delta, but to ESO. That's the fair thing to do because of course the spin orbit energy uh, limits your maximum topological gap. So again, we see that um, the topological phase can only live inside of these triangles and it does not occupy the whole thing. It occupies a significant region of the, of the triangle, but uh, I guess there is still room for improvement. What I wanna point out is that we do get fully gapped topological phases in this realistic model where the parameters are chosen uh, realistically and importantly, we chose the parameters, the geometry, according to this condition of L times delta equals alpha. Uh, and that helps us to, to design the geometry. And again, I just wanna stress this, this, this is a phase diagram without applying 
any Zeeman or orbital field uh, to the sample itself. All right, so that was the end of the first story about non-planar uh, geometries. And now I wanna move to, uh, to talk about planar models and in particular ones that have a single subband. So before the model with two layers, you should really think about them um, as anything that has more than one band. But now I wanna see if we can make it work using just, um, just one band. And this is a paper that I've co-authored with Yuval Oeg and with Amir Jacobi and his students, Andrew and uh, Marie. So uh, we're gonna go back to our precious now, the ring. So um, the idea that we're gonna have here, I'm reminding you is that we'll take this ring and we'll make copies of it and then we will couple them in the plane. So let me show you how this works. So we start by taking two rings and then we're gonna tune the parameters of each of the rings. So such that each one of them has a zero energy, has a pair of zero energy uh, Majorana states. So, um, uh, you know, we have alpha one, beta one here, alpha two and beta two here. And now we introduce the coupling between them, this, uh, this purple line. And we're going to examine the spectrum of this uh, two ring system as a function of this, uh, of this extra spin orbit phase lambda prime connecting the two. And what we find is that there are special points in this, uh, in this uh, curve where the first, the lowest energy is zero and the second lowest energy is at some finite energy. So what does that mean? It means that we have actually turned off all the couplings between these four Majoranas except for one, except for let's say beta one and alpha two. So beta one and alpha two are gonna be gapped out and we're left with alpha one, which is completely localized at the left ring and beta two, which is completely localized at the right ring. So basically separated the two uh, and, and we've separated them spatially. And if you want, if you're saying, well, that's still too close, I wanna get them even farther away from one another, that's very easy to do. Right, because now you can take, you can just repeat this unit cell and you can connect them. It doesn't really matter how these unit, cell are, unit cells are connected. Generically, what's gonna happen is that whatever is here is gonna hybridize with whatever is here. And at the end of the day, you're gonna finish with one Majorana localized at the leftmost string and the other one localized at the rightmost string. So that's gonna be um, analogous to the Kitaev chain at the perfectly localized uh, so-called sweet spot. So now what we wanna do is take these nice ideas and translate them into realistic devices in the plane. And uh, the, the, the host system is again gonna be a 2D electron gas with strong spin orbit coupling. On top of that, we're gonna have, so these are the, the green regions. And on top of that, we're gonna have uh, three superconductors. So we have one at the top, at the bottom and in the middle, and they are phase biased. So you can now bring this picture back of the um, of the uh, toy model of the ring, and you can think of it as some sort of a more realistic implementation of this um, of this model. And uh, because you can still have these trajectories uh, right where you where you um, uh, pick up a non-zero one of Kashel phase. And at the right here, you see an experimental sketch of how this could be uh, uh, realized. So including all of these uh, uh, superconductors and the bridges connecting them to maintain phase coherence and these flux or current loops uh, that are meant to phase bias the superconductors. And the Hamiltonian is really uh, exceedingly simple. The first line is just a 2D electron gas, plain old uh, 2 dead. And all of the interesting physics comes from the second line that tells you about the spatial structure, so magnitude and phase of the pair potential. So again, we're now gonna repeat this exercise of discretizing the system and then studying the phase diagrams. And here, the material platform that we chose to, to simulate is uh, mercury telluride, a very strong spin orbit um, uh, to the electron gas with aluminum on top. 
So here is an example for a size diagram. Again, we're using our, rules, our uh, rule of thumb, L delta equals to alpha, to get a ballpark of where the parameters, the geometrical parameters should be. So again, topological phase can only reside inside this triangle, and it fills a part, uh, uh, part of, the, of the triangle, uh, giving us a maximum gap of about 10%. Uh, over 10% of the um, induced gap. And another interesting uh, cut to take is, is actually to look at um, uh, mu and theta. So here I'm fixing phi to zero, and this shows us that we have some stability also to chemical potential um, variations. Now, another cool thing about this, um, this platform is that it allows some things that were problematic before to be very accessible now. Uh, for example, let's take uh, niobium instead of aluminum. So niobium is a very large gap superconductor uh, compared to aluminum. So the gap is about uh, 10 times larger. But the problem is it's type 2 superconductor. So if you want to use it for nanowires or, um, or uh, uh, other existing platforms, it's going to have uh, flux trapping. It's going to ha might have vortices. So uh, it's, it, could, it could be very problematic to use, but in our system, there is no reason not to use uh, niobium and enjoy the, the high gap, the, the large gap uh, induced by it. And indeed, when we calculate the phase diagram of, um, of the system with niobium, we get a very similar uh, type of structure. So again, the gap here is a bit smaller compared to delta, but of course, in absolute numbers, it's much larger than that of uh, aluminum. And there's some structure here, but basically it's, it's the same as the aluminum. And I wanna draw your attention to something in the, uh, the right-hand plot. So here um, we're plotting the, again, the mu theta cut, but I'm also showing, translating mu to uh, approximate values of the carrier density N, because I've been made to understand that people greatly prefer to work at the high carrier density uh, limit away from the bottom of the band because that would uh, greatly reduce the disorder. So as you can see here, uh, it's very much possible to work in the regime of about 10 to the 11 uh, as a density with, with, very, with very large uh, robustness to fluctuations, to typical and experimentally relevant uh, fluctuations of the carrier density. Uh, and now, of course, the picture, again, will not be complete without showing some real space uh, calculations. So let's take a cut through uh, one of the parameters. Here I chose theta with, you know, holding the other ones fixed, but it's completely arbitrary. It can also be phi or mu or uh, whatever you, uh, you prefer. And as you can see, we have states uh, going down to zero, sticking, gap becomes larger, then going back to the trivial phase. Uh, so these Majorana zero modes are what we're after. And if we take a point here close to uh, theta equals pi over four, that would be deep inside the topological phase, then we get the following wave function. So you can look at it as a 2D map or as an integrated, uh, an integrated 1D plot. And as you can see here, what I want you to notice is that the Majorana is pretty much localized at the first unit cell. Right, so uh, if you have a super lattice system, just like we have here, that's basically uh, what you can hope for, right? Localization over one unit cell. All right, so let me quickly recap before we open the floor to, uh, to questions. Um, really, my main message is that time reversal symmetry can be broken, uh, to use the words of, uh, of Adi, in less violent uh, means than directly applying a field. And, and uh, what we propose here is using the superconducting phase bias that you, can, that you can use, that you can get with exceedingly small magnetic fields, less than a microtest. In terms of geometries, I've shown you planar and non-planar uh, uh, proposals, but my main, my main uh, takeaway from this and what I want you to, um, to, to have in mind is that this, is, this is really should be thought of as a general design principle. Right. Whenever you have a model where you can think of a closed trajectory that has uh, an Aonov-Kachel phase and also 
superconducting phase winding, you're probably going to be able to get Majoranus without applying any magnetic field. So if you think of something like that, and you can design a new device, which you, you find more convenient, then that would be uh, uh, great. Okay, with that, I want to finish and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Omri. So we can open the floor to questions. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, I was wondering uh, what you're doing here is you are applying a phase bias by hand, but can you actually also get a system where you just spontaneously break the reversal symmetry and develop a phase bias? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, so basically, what you're saying is that we can just not phase bias the system and then let the system decide for itself uh, which phases to pick. And uh, this was actually done in the context of the um, original proposal by Pianka et al. and Hell et al. And there, we, they, they found that when you, um, there are some regimes where the system spontaneously chooses to have a phase difference of pi. Um, now, this actually does not happen here. Uh, it does not happen here if you just look at the free energy and you, uh, you look at it as a function of the three, of let's say the two phase differences. Uh, they would usually choose to actually align with each other. And I think the way to understand it is that in the planar Josephson junction, time reversal symmetry was already broken by the field. So the phases did not have to, uh, to be the first ones to break it, right? Uh, it's possible that if you now bias only one of the phase differences, that the other one will, uh, will choose to wind. But I'm not sure if that happens or not. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yuichi, would you like to ask you a question? Yes. Uh, so in your second proposal, you use mercury telluride, which can be a topological insulator. But I think in your scenario, the topological insulator nature is not used. So my question is, what happens if it turns into a topological insulator with a strain? Okay, so that's, uh, so you're completely right. I'm not, I'm assuming it's not in the topological insulator uh, regime. Uh, basically, I would assume that what would happen, if it is, then it would more or less be realizing the Fu and King model, right? And then, and then, well, then the story is solved. Um, but I think it would be more more challenging experimentally to get to this regime. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, can I ask one, Gil? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I was curious about the size scales of the planar design that you showed. Um, if you if you do your best to estimate the the linear dimensions uh, that would be required to make this, can you um, can you still have appreciable charging energies, which would be very convenient for um, eventual qubit operation? Right. So that's okay. That's a very good question. So uh, this would really depend on your material platform. So for the first material platform we chose, which was um, mercury telluride with aluminum, then the typical, the typical length would be hundreds of nanometers, right? But when you go to niobium, since delta becomes larger by a factor of 10, then L times delta should be, should be uh, the same more or less. And then the, the sizes would, would reduce to tens of, of nanometers. Uh, so that really depends on your, on your materials, yeah. Uh, it's hard for me to see the raised ends on my screen, but I'm getting help. So, I, I, Bert, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I'm sorry. I, this goes back to the, 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 the first part of the talk, uh, or the end of the first part of the talk, where you showed this uh, platform where you, uh, you, you, you took your uh, cylinder and broke it up and uh, made it into a plane with two different uh, uh, alphas on the two sides. And I didn't exactly understand... Uh, what is in between here? This, this is a, is this a single semiconductor substrate that somehow uh, has uh, a, a different alpha because of uh, spin orbit coupling being different on the two sides? What is it exactly that you have in mind there? Maybe you said it, but I, 
I, I missed. No, so it's, it's a wonderful question. Uh, the answer is you can think of it as, as a bilayer of a, of a uh, 2D electron gas. So actually one layer and another layer, and you, you somehow, if maybe you gate them to have different spin orbits, maybe they naturally have the different spin orbits. Uh, but you can also just think of a single quantum well, which has two subbands, and they would generically not have the same spin orbit coupling. And that would be enough for me. Okay, all right. So it could be a single quantum well, or or maybe a double quantum well. But obviously, you have if it's a double quantum well, you want electrons to go back and forth between the two wells e easily. Precisely. Yeah. Okay, that's what's going on. Uh, Roland, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Uh, hi, Omri. Thank you for a nice talk. I I wanted to ask you uh, how sensitive is is your proposal on on hitting the precise values of these phases or phase differences? And how realistic is it that you, that you reach these, these optimal values? All right. Oh, wait. So there are two questions here. Uh, regarding the, phase, the phase differences, uh, this, this is my answer. So it can be pretty robust, right? So you, it's enough to tune the phase differences to anywhere in this region. Uh, but if you're asking about the other parameters, right, the chemical potential, the uh, spin orbit, stuff like that. So that's, that's a very good question. And uh, the way we attack this problem is we assume there are some God-given parameters, like, for example, the spin orbit energy, uh, delta, and so on. And we're examining the dependence on the other parameters. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, it's not too sensitive, right? It, it, it would, uh, if you want to get the best, the best possible gaps, then yeah, you have to tune well, but if you're in, if you're okay with like uh, maybe half of that, it's very, very not fine tuned. And we actually have very detailed results for this in, in the appendices of both of our papers. So uh, you can take a look. But, but still in these triangles, I suppose you want to, to hit the, the darkest blue regions. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks. And maybe last question for this talk, uh, Leonid, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, probably it's just a repetition of the previous one. So uh, can you summarize, um, in the best case scenario, the gap you are achieving in the topological state uh, divided by the gap at all phases equals zero. This, what is the best value of this ratio? Right, so, so the gap, the, the ratio, uh, depending on the, on the, um, um, uh, Proposal, right? So there are one where it's ten percent, and there are ones where it's thirty thirty percent. Okay, so thirty percent is the best number. Sorry, thirty percent is the best number. It's the best number that we were able to achieve so far. Yep. But I have to admit, we haven't spent like tons of time on optimizing this. It's definitely possible to optimize further. If that's the question, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great, thanks. So let's thank Omri for uh, for a very nice talk, very nice work.